Hi, in this video we're going to look at some definitions and theorems about local or they're sometimes called relative extrema of multivariable functions. So you did local maximum, local minimum problems in Calculus 1 and the more you remember about that the easier this material will be for you. There are a few places where something's a little bit more complicated because we have more variables but the main ideas are basically the same. Okay, so first of all, a couple of vocabulary words here. Uh, I've written my definitions for functions of three variables. If you have more or less variables, you just have more or less coordinates in these points, but otherwise the definitions are really the same. Okay, so if I have a function defined on some domain containing this specific point, x0, y0, z0, we say that f has a local or relative maximum at that point if and then this inequality here is really the key point of the definition. f of x0, y0, z0 is greater than or equal to all the other function outputs for all domain points in some open neighborhood of our specific point. So by some open neighborhood, essentially we mean near x0, y0, z0 and all around x0, y0, z0, so on all sides. The key point I want you to remember about this definition is this greater than or equal to thing here. Sometimes when I ask students about this definition, they will say where the function outputs are bigger than all the other function outputs. Uh, and so that's partly right, but it does say greater than or equal to all the other function outputs. All right, one other thing about this definition, this just says that the function has a local or relative maximum at the point x0, y0, z0, but if we wanted to actually talk about what that local maximum of the function is, we would say that the local maximum of that function is actually the output of the function at that point. So it's important when you're being asked a question about these that you pay attention to exactly how the question is asked, especially if you have online homework, it can be really picky about that. Is it asking you about the points at which the maximum or minimum values occur? Or is it asking you to actually find the actual maximum or minimum values, that the local maximum is something? So it's a difference in asking you about inputs for a function, x0, y0, z0, versus outputs for the function. So just pay careful attention to that, and if you're missing some problems, especially on your online homework, you might look at whether that's the issue, is that you've done all the work correctly, or just not kind of interpreting what it's actually asking you to type in for your answer. Okay, so this next definition is pretty similar. Uh, it's defining a local minimum at a point, and the key part here is this inequality here, that instead of greater than or equal to, we have less than or equal to. So we have point where the function output is less than or equal to all the other function outputs nearby. And again, we would say that the local minimum of the function is the function output at that point. All right, and you might remember from Calculus 1 that when you were finding local max and local min points, you started by finding critical points for the function. We actually have a theorem that relates those ideas, but hopefully this is not new information for you, thinking about critical points of a function. Uh, and when you were in Calculus 1, you probably thought about critical points as thinking about where the derivative of the function is equal to zero or does not exist. And it's the same basic idea here. The critical point of a function f is an interior point of the domain of the function at which instead of just a derivative equal to zero here, notice that you've got your gradient vector equal to, and then that's a bold zero there, so that's the zero vector, or the gradient does not exist. So remembering that that gradient would help you find the derivative in all directions, if your gradient vector is zero, then your derivatives in all directions would be zero. So it's the same basic idea here. Um, remember though that what you have here is a vector. So your gradient vector, uh, if you have a function of three variables, del f del x, del f del y, and del f del z, and you would want that gradient vector to equal zero, so all three components of that gradient vector would need to be zero at the same time. So when we think about finding critical points, we're essentially going to have a system of equations where each component derivative is going to be set equal to zero, or also where that gradient vector does not exist. 
It would not exist if any one of the components does not exist. Okay, so uh, the last vocabulary word here is actually something you would have seen in Calculus 1, but you may not have called it a saddle point. Saddle point of a function f is a critical point of a function that is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. So the easy example that you might have seen in Calculus 1 is like the function y equals x cubed. That has a critical point at x equals 0. If you take the derivative and set it equal to 0, you get x equals 0 as a critical point. But that critical point at x equals 0 is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. The actual definition of saddle point, if you look in our textbook, says that every open neighborhood around that critical point is going to contain points where the function outputs are more than the function output at your critical point, and every open neighborhood around your critical point will contain places where the function outputs are smaller. So the point can't be a maximum or minimum location because you're always going to have places where the function outputs are larger and the function outputs are smaller. For multivariable functions, you might think about a function like f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared, and the graph of a function like that would look like one of those saddle graphs. So if you think about like the Pringle chip graphs that we looked at. So if I think about uh, something that sort of looks like a Pringle chip here, it's not a lovely picture, but a Pringle chip, that that point where in one direction you've got a parabola that's opening up and the lowest point on that parabola, but in another direction you've got a parabola that's opening down, and the highest point on that parabola would be a saddle point. Every neighborhood around that point would contain points on the surface where the function outputs are higher, if you're on that parabola that opens upward, but it also would contain points where the function outputs are lower, if you're on that parabola opening down. So every neighborhood around that point is going to contain places where both the function outputs are larger and smaller. All right, we're going to look at a couple theorems here. This first theorem corresponds to a theorem you had in Calculus 1, um, perhaps called Fermat's theorem. There are many many Fermat's theorems, but this is one of them, says that if your function f has a local extrema, so a local max or min value, uh, at an interior point of the domain of f, then that point where that occurs is a critical point of f. Okay, so in Calc 1, this is basically the theorem that said if you're going to do a local max min problem, you're going to start by finding the critical points. So in Calc 1, that was take the derivative and set that equal to zero and also think about where that derivative does not exist. For multivariable functions, basically the same idea about how to start, but you're going to take the gradient, you're going to set that equal to the zero vector, and you're also going to think about where that gradient does not exist. Okay, and then once you've found your critical points, essentially that helps you find your critical points, but once you've found your critical points in Calculus 1, you had to use some sort of test to determine whether those critical points were locations of a local maximum or a local minimum or maybe neither. And so in Calculus 1, you had a couple different tests, a first derivative test, a second derivative test. The first derivative test looked at where the function was increasing or decreasing on either side of the critical point, and then you would be able to determine if the critical point was a maximum or a minimum or neither. That won't work for multivariable functions because you'd have to be able to look at increasing and decreasing essentially in all directions around the point. Um, but what we do have for multivariable functions is a second derivative test. So this is what we will generally be using for multivariable functions. This one that I've written down here is for functions of two variables. All of your homework and most of the problems in our textbook actually are for functions of two variables. So this is what you'll be using with most of your homework. I do eventually want you to know this, but I do usually provide this theorem on the unit exam over this chapter because this comes so close to the end of the chapter. But by the final exam, you need to make sure that you know this theorem. So you might set a goal for learning it for this unit test, but knowing that it will be provided in case you have forgotten. All right, so this theorem says, uh, if I have a function with continuous second partial derivatives throughout an open disk containing our specific point, AB, where AB is a critical point of f of x, y, all right, and then the big deal part of this theorem is this D function, which we're going to use to help us classify 
our critical point as location that gives a local maximum, a local minimum, or a saddle point. D maybe stands for discriminant because this is a function that helps you discriminate between a maximum or a minimum or a saddle point, but it also might stand for determinant. Uh, this D is actually a determinant of a two by two matrix with all the second derivatives of your function in that matrix with the second pure partial derivatives on this main diagonal and the mixed second partial derivatives on the other diagonal. And if you take the determinant of that, you would have the product fxx times fyy minus the product of the mixed second partial derivatives. And notice that if the conditions of this theorem are met, continuous second partial derivatives throughout an open region containing our point, then those mixed second partial derivatives should be equal. So I have that term with the mixed second partial derivative squared. So that's one way to help you remember it. But basically you look at the sign on this D function. So in looking at this theorem, you should notice that there's one part of the theorem that talks about if the D is greater than zero and another part of the theorem that talks about if the D is less than zero. All right, so if the D is greater than zero, then basically I need to look at what these other parts say here are the sign on the second pure partial with respect to x. So I want to talk a little bit about what this theorem really is saying in terms of the geometry of the surface and why this would be the way it is. That'll help you remember this theorem and what it tells you so that eventually you'll be able to know this. All right, so this D function is this product of all these second partial derivatives. If you think about a surface in 3D and you think about what these second partial derivatives mean, so if I'm at a particular point, the second pure partials are essentially describing the concavity. If you look at a slice of that surface in the x direction or in the y direction. And so the second partial derivatives are describing something about the concavity. The mixed second partial derivative is describing something a little more complicated than that. If you think about this function of two variables and you think about, for example, the partial derivative with respect to x at a point, that would give you the slope of a tangent line in the x direction. And then the mixed partial derivative would be if I think about that slope at that point and then I let that point slide in the y direction. So I move that in the y direction. How does this change when we move then in the y direction? And that's what the mixed second partial derivative would describe. So that's a little bit harder to visualize. But the second pure partial derivative describing concavity should be pretty easy for you to think about. All right, so I want you to think about this D function and when this D function would be positive and when it would be negative. First of all, if the pure second partial derivatives have to do with concavity, uh, if those are both the same sign, so either both positive or both negative, then this part here will be positive, and then I might have some amount to subtract off here, but those second pure partials with respect to x and y will both have to be the same sign in order for this D function to even have a chance of being positive. So when this D function is negative, uh, one way that that can happen is when you've got your fxx and your fyy as opposite signs, which would indicate you have concave up in one direction and concave down in another direction, so a saddle point. So in order for D to be positive, you need your fxx and fyy to be the same sign and this mixed second partial derivative should not be too large. So when you square that and subtract that off, that shouldn't be too large. So you shouldn't have too much of something different happening when you're looking at this slope and how that changes when you go in the y direction. All right, so if the fxx and fyy are the same sign, then you're gonna either be concave up all around or concave down all around. And in essence, what you're looking at with this second pure partial with respect to x is you're looking at concavity in the x direction. So if your second pure partial with respect to x is positive, then hopefully you remember from Calc 1 that would mean you have concave up graph in that direction, and so your critical point would be a relative minimum. And if your second partial derivative is negative, 
then your graph would be concave down and so your critical point would be a relative maximum. Um, if the d function is negative, that can happen when your fxx and your fyy are opposite signs or it can happen in when they are the same sign, fxx and fyy are the same, but the fxy and the fyx product is larger. So that would indicate that you have some different kinds of behavior going on when you're at this point and you let that slide in the y direction. So in essence different in different directions. But the way I remember this is just thinking about well one way that that d function would be negative is when I have concave up in one direction and concave down in another direction and then I can visualize what this saddle point looks like. Okay, we're going to look at some video, some examples in the next video where we look at some specific functions and we find those critical points and classify them as locations that give local maxima, local minima, or saddle points.